mathematics is, as I'm sure most of you know, takes its insight and intuition and beginnings from human experience. Uh, the parts of mathematics we're talking about today derive from our sense of space, of distance, of measurement, of area, of volumes. But it's a mathematician's want to take these intuitive notions and start abstracting them, codifying them, abstracting again, building, and pretty soon the mathematical theory that somehow derived out of this very hands-on experience is not recognizable to anybody except the mathematicians who have gone through this track. That makes it very difficult to give a talk about mathematics with very much content to a general audience like this. Um, but I'm going to attempt to do that. I see many of my mathematician friends in the audience. This talk is not aimed at you, and I <laughs> doubt you'll learn anything new. I see some of my junior fellow friends in the audience, and this talk is aimed at you. I hope you'll get something out of it. Now, uh, I've organized the talk in episodes or parts, and each part, except for the last, is independent of those that go previously. So if halfway through part one you lose the thread, never worry, part two will be coming and you can start over again. So I will have two parts about topology, three different types of geometry, and then at the end I'll try to talk to you about the interactions of these and physics. Oops. So let's start with surfaces. Oh, I should say, I picked out topics that I hope are accessible, but they're topics that I love. So I'm going to have fun. <laughs> I hope you have fun, too. So my first fun is fun with surfaces. So I've drawn a picture of four surfaces. I didn't draw the sphere. I leave that to your imagination. Uh, the one on the left here is the torus. Uh, the one next to it, two-hole torus, a three-hole torus, and you can imagine the pattern here. There's a four-hole torus and so on and so on. A slightly more interesting one is this one over here. It's called the Klein bottle. And the representation we have here is a picture in three-dimensional space, but it's not a faithful representation of this surface because right here, the surface cuts through itself in this picture. But in fact, that's an artifact of this particular picture, and the surface itself doesn't have any of those intersections. You, one way to think about the surface is it can't be put in three-dimensional space. There's no faithful representation of it in three-dimensional space, but it can be put in four-dimensional space. So let's imagine four dimensions. Three of them are the physical dimensions we're used to and that we see here, and the fourth one well, it could be time, but let's take it to be frequency. And so I'm going to color this surface, and the color will represent the position in the fourth dimension. Okay? So most of the surface I'm going to color red. The only part I don't color red is the little neck from, say, here to here. As you come in from this direction, where red here suddenly I start moving up the frequency spectrum. I go to orange, yellow, green, and eventually blue. So by the time I get here, I'm blue. I go across this intersection, and then I reverse the colors from blue back to red, and then I match with the red on the rest of the picture. Okay, so it's now colored. The color representing the fourth dimension we can't see. Okay, now that surface no longer intersects itself. Because to intersect, the, all four coordinates have to be the same. So the only way they can intersect is if they, the coordinates are the same in space. Well, we see this double circle of intersection. But those two circles in the fourth coordinate, one's red and the other's blue. So there's no intersections. So this thing actually embeds in four-dimensional space. It does not embed in three-dimensional space. For those of you who'd like a homework problem, prove it doesn't embed in three-dimensional space. Now, let me give you a top topologist approach to these surfaces. It turns out every one of these surfaces can be made 
by taking a polygon in the plane, here I've got uh, rectangles, and identifying the sides in some pairwise pattern. So if I take this rectangle on the left, and if I identify the upper and lower edges as in the directions the arrows indicate, fold it up, I get a, get a nice cylinder, nice flat cylinder. Now I have the two circles at the end, which are these red circles. They have to be identified. Simply bend the cylinder around and identify, and you get the torus. The one on the right is the same rectangle, but with a different identification of the boundary. So again, you identify the blue. You get a nice cylinder. Now you have to identify these red circles on the end in the opposite way. So if you try to come around like this, you don't get the correct intersection. You get this intersection, not that one. So you have to come around from the other side, which is makes the Klein model. So as we come around, we come in and hit from the other side, reversing the pattern. All these other surfaces are made by taking some planar figures. It won't be rectangles anymore. There'll be more edges on the side. Uh, and identifying them in pairs to make these surfaces. Okay, now I want to talk about the classification of these surfaces, both the nice orientable ones and things like the Klein bottle, which are twisted around and non-orientable. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to associate to each surface an invariant. And this invariant is going to be a matrix. Okay? And the way we do it is Starting with the surface, we make a group. For reasons I won't go into, we'll call it H1 of sigma. It's simply all formal linear combinations of coefficients, numbers ni, times loops on the surface, gamma i. But the ni are only counted modulo 2. So 2 times gamma is equal to 0. 3 times gamma is equal to gamma. Okay. Now you introduce, among all those linear combinations, a relation which says any time you have a collection of curves with coefficient 1 that bounds a surface inside your surface, you set that combination equal to 0. OK, oops, wrong way. So I've drawn a couple of pictures of things that are related. Any time you have two curves, the red one and the purple one that are parallel, one is a deformation of the other, those curves are equal to each other in this group because between them there's a nice annulus. So this curve, the purple one, one times the purple one and one times the red one form the same element in the group that I'm making. And this one over here, the brown one, is set equal to zero because it bounds this part of the surface. All right, so you make this group. Not completely clear what the group looks like or what its structure is, but that's its definition. All right. Turns out this group has on it a natural bilinear pairing. If you have two elements in the group, you can assign what we'll call an intersection number, a number to a pair of elements. If the elements are curves, it's simply the number of times these curves meet each other. Okay. So here's some curves on the surface and intersection numbers. In the upper left-hand corner, I have the torus. I have two curves on it. It turns out every curve is related to one of those two in this group. The first one intersects itself zero because you can push it off. Likewise for the second, but clearly the first and second intersect once. Here we have four curves on a two-hole torus repeating this pattern twice. Here we have six curves on a three-hole torus repeating the pattern six times. And here we have a Möbius band made by taking the rectangle and identifying this side with this one by flipping. And the central curve in the Möbius band meets itself once because here is a push-off of it. And you see the intersection number is one. OK. So that's the way I'm going to make my invariance of surfaces. So we choose a basis for this group, basis of loops, and then the pairing is represented by a symmetric matrix, which is simply the intersection numbers of the, the curves in the basis. 
If we change the basis, it turns out we conjugate the matrix by that formula. And there's a beautiful theorem in mathematics called Poincaré duality, which tells us this matrix always has determinant one. We can now classify these matrices up to this conjugation relation, uh, and there are two types. There are matrices which up to conjugation are simply a collection of these blocks, 0, 1, 1, 0, some number of times. That's one type of matrix. And the other is a matrix with ones down the diagonal and all the other entries zero. This, this classification of these symmetric matrices is a complete invariant of the surfaces. So every surface has an intersection matrix. Two surfaces are equivalent if and only if the intersection matrices are conjugate. And we have a complete list of all surfaces these matrices correspond to the torus, the two-hole torus, the three-hole torus, and so on. And we saw that pattern of intersection. Um, whoops. And this, these matrices correspond to surfaces that have on them curves that meet themselves once. Those are Möbius bands. And so all these surf surfaces that go with these pairings are non-orientable. So we have a com what's called a complete invariant of sigma. We have an algebraic object we associate to sigma, and it completely determines sigma. Okay. Okay. There are, of course, higher dimensional analogs of surfaces, and higher dimensional analogs of the idea on, of curves on a surface. In dimension n, we call these objects manifolds. Uh, and the defining property of a manifold is that near every point in the space, you can find local coordinates which look like the coordinates x1 to xn in some little piece of Euclidean space. One also has, as I said, analogs of curves on the surface. They're called cycles. For a surface, we only had to think about ordinary curves. When we think about higher dimensional manifolds, we have to think about cycles of all dimensions, and this generalization about the way curves intersect each other is reflected in the fact that in dimension n, subspaces of dimension k and dimension n minus k meet, and again, there's a duality theorem that says the matrix of intersections always has determinant plus or minus one. So that's the topology of surfaces, a complete classification of what all surfaces look like, was known in the 19th century. Now I'm going to talk about an extra structure that you can put on a surface, one that comes up all the time in practice when you're studying geometry, physics, many other parts of mathematics. It's the structure that allows you to do analytic operations on the surface. And the idea is the quality of a surface, so locally all surfaces of dimension n, all n manifolds, look the same. They look like a little piece of Euclidean space and they have these local Euclidean coordinates. The quality of a manifold is determined by how these local coordinates overlap. In topology, we make no condition of, on the overlap at all except continuity. But a natural condition to put on, and one that comes up a lot in practice, is to require the overlap functions to be smooth. So you have two sets of coordinates. You can look on the overlap at the functions, the coordinate functions in one, and ask what sort of functions are they of the other coordinates? And if those functions are smooth, you say the overlap is smooth. And if you can cover the manifold by these patches so that all overlaps are smooth, you say the manifold is smooth and you've determined a smooth atlas coordinate patches that cover the manifold for that manifold. So let me just give you briefly one quick example of a smooth structure, a smooth structure on the circle. We could take stereographic projection from the North Pole 0, 1, and that identifies all of the circle except the North Pole with the x-axis and thus gives us a coordinate x everywhere except the North Pole. We could do the same thing from the South Pole and get a different coordinate, x prime I'm calling it, everywhere except the South Pole. You do a little elementary trigonometry and you learn that 
x prime and x are related by this equation, x prime is 4 divided by x. So x prime is a smooth function of x, and you can reverse that and see that x is a smooth function of x prime. So we've defined on the circle a smooth atlas. Oops. So one advantage of assuming the overlap functions are smooth, or at least continuously differentiable, is that the manifold has a tangent space or a linear approximation at every point, and the tangent space to an n-dimensional manifold is an n-dimensional vector space, the vector space of all tangents at that point. Maybe this is easiest to think about if the space, the manifold, is embedded in ordinary space, then the tangent space, as in this picture, at a point is simply the linear space that's the best approximation to the curved manifold at this point. Well, I want to tell you one of the most amazing theorems in all of topology. It certainly took the topologists by surprise when it was discovered. Milner showed in 1956 that if you take the ordinary round seven-dimensional sphere and you ask about differentiable atlases on that sphere, it turns out that they're inequivalent ones. They're different ways of systematically doing calculus on the seven-dimensional sphere. So if you have two differentiable structures on the seven sphere, you have the identity map of the seven sphere to itself. It's a continuous isomorphism, but there's no way to find a smooth isomorphism between these coordinate charts here and the other charts over there. So that was non-uniqueness. A few years later, uh, Crevair actually showed that there's a 10-dimensional topological manifold. So it has these coordinates with continuous overlap, and there is no way to jiggle them and make them all smooth. So there's a real difference between differential topology and continuous topology. So that's one theorem I wanted to uh, uh, indicate to you. The other is the Poincaré conjecture, which really was the basis of all the developments in higher dimensional topology. He asked, in analogy with what happens in dimension two, if you have a three-dimensional manifold in every loop can be shrunk to a point inside the manifold, then is the manifold equivalent to the three-dimensional sphere? He asked that in 1905. Well, it was answered in 2003 in the affirmative by Russian mathematician Perlman. And using the same techniques, Perlman went on to solve the classification problem for three-dimensional manifolds, which is similar but much more complicated than the classification problem I indicated for surfaces, two-dimensional manifolds. And at the end, well, when I talk about geometry, I'll briefly discuss the method Perlman used to prove this theorem. This, this result, this was the most famous problem in topology for 98 years, and wave after wave, generation after generation of topologists tried to answer it uh, with no success. Using geometry, Perlman was able to solve it. Okay, that's the end of part one of topology. Surfaces and their higher dimensional analogs, manifolds and the way we think about them, and a couple of typical results that have been established. Now we go back to something where we can actually see what we're talking about, though it does us absolutely no good, and that's knots. So I've drawn here, so a knot's a closed loop in space. I've drawn two knots. They have names, the trefoil knot and the figure eight knot. In fact, there's whole tables of knots with names, and stevedores like these things, for example. So this is an old and wonderful part of topology. We'll also talk about links. A link is simply a disjoint collection of knots, but they're allowed to intertwine themselves or each other. They're not separated out, but it's got in circles somehow tangled up together instead of one. That's called a link. Basic problem is always in mathematics. List all the knots and links and find invariants like our matrix that'll distinguish them. 
So that if two knots are different, your invariance will tell you they're different. It's a basic problem, it's unsolved. So one way to think about a knot is called the planar projection. You take the knot in three-dimensional space and you simply project it onto a plane. If you do this generically, you'll get a curve much like the one I've drawn here. It crosses over itself in some crazy way. To specify the knot, you have to specify the crossing data at every one of these points of intersection. You have to say which of the two strands goes over and which goes under. It turns out that completely determines the knot. If you always went, if you started at some point and every time you came to a crossing, you went over, well, let me not say that. I'm gonna get myself confused. Anyway, that's one way to think about knots, planar projection and crossing data. But this is not a very good way to think about knots because knots have lots and lots of different planar projections. And it's not clear when two planar projections will give you, and crossing data will give you equivalent knots or links. So this isn't a very um, fruitful way to think about knots. Another way to think about knots is in terms of braids. So on the left we have what you think, typically think of as a braid. And here, mathematical braids. So a braid has some number of strands. In both of the mathematical pictures, there are four strands. And those strands move vertically, but are allowed to wrap around each other. But they always keep moving vertically. They don't come back and knot. Well, that's not a knot or a link, but it's easy to take one of these braids and turn it into a knot or a link. Imagine the braid sits in a solid cylinder. Here's its top, here's its bottom, and all the strands are contained here. Simply take that cylinder and bend it around and identify it, and now the braid runs around in a cytosolid torus, and it will make a knot or a link depending on how the, um, well, how the strands are connected. Turns out every knot has a braid presentation, and again, there are some elementary moves, and if two braids give the same knot, then some sequence of those elementary moves turns one to the other. But again, this is not such a fruitful way, at least to classify knots or braids. Okay, I said that. I want to tell you about a fairly recent invariant of knots it's called the Jones polynomial. It was introduced in, I don't know, 1983 maybe, and it was the first new invariant of knots in about 100 years. But when I present it to you, you'll think, well, why didn't people think of that? There's lots of invariants like this. So the, the uh, Jones polynomial is a polynomial in a variable t, actually t to the 1 half and t to the minus 1 half, and it satisfies a skein relation. If you have a knot and you focus on some little piece of it where there's a crossing and you simply reverse that crossing or cut the strands and make a different knot or link by gluing up in the other way and keep the rest of the picture exactly the same as it was before, okay? Then you get a Jones polynomial for this knot, Jones polynomial for this knot or link, and the Jones polynomial for this one, and they satisfy this polynomial relation. It's not too hard to see that any relation like this will completely determine the Jones polynomial of a knot. You go around looking for crossings where changing the crossing will simplify the knot. This knot already has fewer crossings, and you can have an inductive or recursive scheme to figure out what the value of this polynomial is on any knot. The only problem is, suppose you do this in a completely different way, why should you get the same answer? not clear at all from the skein relation. Uh, Jones actually started uh, with the braid group and representations of that group and deduced this as a, a posteriori after he had, using braid, shown he had a well-defined invariant. Just to give you an indication of what these polynomials look like, I wrote down the Jones polynomial for the trap well. Okay. Again, if you want a homework exercise, Take this skein relation, take the picture I gave you of the trefoil knot, apply this relation over and over again and prove that. It's a simple computation. 
So as I said, this invariant was introduced in 1983, was the first invariant in the last 100 years. There have been since then many extensions and generalizations. The Jones polynomial is not a complete invariant. There are different knots with the same Jones polynomial, but it does have some nice features. The unknot is characterized by the Jones polynomial. So if you have a knot and you calculate its Jones polynomial and you get the same answer as you get for the unknot, it is the unknot. So that's good. And using the skein relation, you can prove that not every knot in space can be unknotted by simply reversing one crossing. Believe it or not, that wasn't known. From the beginning of knot theory, everyone believed that if a knot was sufficiently complicated, there was no way changing one crossing would unknot it, but there was no proof until the Jones polynomial came along. Because the Jones polynomial uses either a braid representation or a planar projection, it only applies to knots in ordinary Euclidean space, not to knots in more general three-dimensional manifolds. But in fact, we now know how to do it. Physics provides a natural generalization to knots and links in all three-dimensional manifolds. And I'll talk about that uh, at the end of my talk. All right. That's your introduction to topology. Surfaces in their classification and a little bit about higher dimensional analogs of surfaces. Some fun with knot theory. Now I'm going to move to geometry. And I'm going to talk about three types of geometry. Ramanian geometry, complex geometry, and symplectic geometry. OK. This is, we've upped the level a little bit here. I apologize. But geometry is more complicated than topology. That's why I'm a topologist. All right. So a Ramanian metric is, first of all, you have to be on a smooth manifold. You have to have these smoothly overlapping coordinates and tangent planes. And a Ramanian metric is simply a, is an infinitesimal notion. It gives you a length of tangent vectors in, for tangent vectors at every point. Um, and that, that notion of the length of a tangent vector has to move smoothly as you move around the manifold. Actually, you not only have the length the way I presented it here, we have a bilinear form. So given two tangent vectors, you have their inner product, which I've called. So tau 1 and tau 2 are tangent vectors at P. This is the inner product of tau 1 and tau 2 at P. And we want tangent vectors to have positive length, which means I need the inner product of a tangent vector with itself to be positive for every non-zero tangent vector. So maybe the easiest thing to think about is the case of manifolds embedded in, I've got a surface here in three-dimensional space. Then the tangent space to the manifold is naturally a plane in three-dimensional space. And that plane already has its Euclidean metric or Euclidean inner product or distance. So simply restrict that to the tangent plane. That will be a smoothly varying family of uh, Ramanian metrics at points, and that will be a Ramanian metric on the manifold. It's metric induced from Euclidean space. Okay. Well, Ramanian metrics, as I said, gives us length of tangent vectors, squares of lengths. We take the square root. Once we have lengths of tangent vectors, we can measure lengths of smooth curves by the usual formula, distance is speed times time. So you simply take the speed, which is the size or the absolute value of the derivative, and you integrate against time, and you get the length of the curve, the distance you've traveled. So this allows us to talk about the distance between two points in our manifold. You simply take, of all the paths, the shortest one, it's called a geodesic, take its length. That's the distance between the points in the manifold. Uh, we not only have lengths of curves, we also have areas of surfaces and volumes of higher dimensional objects in the manifold. Now, every smooth manifold has a Ramanian metric. You can always impose the kind of structure that I was just talking about. The problem is it has lots of them. It has an infinite dimensional space of Ramanian metrics. And it's hard, in general, to pick out a good one. So just think about the surface of the Earth. We abstract it. We think of a nice round metric. 
But in fact, the surface of the Earth is far from round. You've got the hills and the valleys and the mountains. That's another Riemannian metric. Well, that gives you a sense of the possible variations. You just think about erosion and what that does to the metric on the surface of the Earth. There's a whole infinite dimensional family of metrics, too many metrics. Gauss defined, Gauss defined the curvature for surfaces, called the Gaussian curvature, for surfaces actually embedded in three-dimensional space. He, he defined it using the embedding in three-dimensional space, but then he gave a beautiful formula for it, which says that the curvature at a point is the comparison of the area of a ball of radius r in flat space and the area of a ball of radius r centered at this point in the surface normalized divided by r to the fourth over 12. I forgot to take a limit as r goes to zero. Now, you're, in a way, you're familiar with this. If I take the cap of an orange peel, that's a positively curved piece of surface. If I put it on the plane and I squash it, it tears. So what's happened when I squash it flat is it had a radius which went around the cap. When I squash it flat, that's now the radius in space. And the tearing is because there isn't enough area in this orange peel to fill up the area of the flat ball. The orange peel has less area than the flat ball of the same radius. So this difference is positive, reflecting the fact that the orange peel is positively curved. If you take a saddle, which is a negatively curved space, and do the same thing, it will overlap itself because it has too much area, an area excess. So this local area result, in fact, globalizes to the one, one of the most beautiful and powerful interactions or connections between geometry and topology. It's called the Gauss-Binet theorem. So if you have a surface, and you integrate, you put on a metric, and you integrate the curvature, the Gaussian curvature, over the entire surface against area, you will get a topological invariant. You'll get 2 pi times what's called the Euler characteristic. The Euler characteristic is simply 2 minus the number of circles we needed to use in our matrix. It's also, if the surface happened to be divided up into triangles, triangulated, number of vertices minus number of edges plus number of faces in that triangulation. So it's purely topological invariant. And this Riemannian curvature, in fact, averages out to give that topological invariant. If you have a torus, this number for the torus is 0. In fact, the torus has a flat metric. Take the cylinder, take an infinite cylinder, and simply identify by translation by a unit length down the cylinder, that will make a flat structure on the torus. Can't embed that structure in three space, but it does have a flat metric. So the curvature of that metric is zero. Two pi times the Euler characteristic, well, the Euler characteristic is also zero. So for these toruses in three dimensional space, they have regions of positive curvature on the outside, regions of negative curvature on the inside, but it all has to average out to zero. The consequence of the Gauss-Binet theorem. Well, a few words about higher dimensional spaces, not just surfaces. These uh, Gauss curvatures, in fact, generalize in a higher dimensional manifold at every point and in every two-plane direction, you have a Gaussian curvature. So you have a whole collection of Gaussian curvatures. They fit together to form a multilinear object, which is called a tensor, and I've written down a formula for it. Uh, this is called the Riemannian curvature tensor. This, curv so, this curvature tensor is used to define certain higher dimensional differential forms that carry important topological information, generalizing the Gauss-Binet theorem for surfaces and demonstrating a close connection between topology and Riemannian geometry in higher dimensions. I'm not going to try to give you any details about that, just tell you that it's true. But maybe more interestingly for what's coming, Riemann proved that his curvature tensor is the complete obstruction to finding 
local coordinates in which the metric is the Euclidean metric, the standard summation d, uh, xi squared. So if the curvature vanishes in a region, you can find local coordinates in that region so the metric looks like the flat Euclidean metric. He interpreted this as meaning that curvature is responsible for force. Because if a space is curved, these shortest, ge these shortest paths, these geodesics, will, will not follow straight lines, but will move around according to the metric. And therefore, no matter what coordinate system you take, and you look at the path of a particle, it will be bending. Well, what's causing that bending? You'd attribute it to a force. Okay. Well, of course, uh, later Einstein developed this idea magnificently in the theory of general relativity, which is based on Ramanian geometry. So I just I want to finish with uh, circling back to the three-dimensional problem, the Poincaré conjecture. And for that, I need to introduce a simpler curvature, which is derived from the Ramanian curvature, but is not as complicated. It's called the Ricci curvature. And uh, so it only has two indices rather than the four of Ramanian curvature. It's less information, except in dimension two and three. But it has the same tensor structure as the metric. And so we can use this Ricci tensor to deform the metric, write down a partial differential equation, deform the metric, which I'm writing as Gij, by the Ricci curvature, or minus the Ricci curvature. Okay. Well, this is an evolution equation for the metric, and this is the one that Perlman used to show that these three-dimensional simply connected spaces are uh, equivalent to the three-sphere. He applied this he started with any metric on the three-dimensional manifold, applied this evolution equation, and showed that as time went on, the metric began to shrink down to a point, and as it did, it became rounder and rounder, meaning Gauss curvature plus one in all directions. Since manifolds with Gauss curvature plus one in all directions are easily seen to be the sphere, this shows your manifold is, in fact, approaching in a very strong sense to the sphere, and therefore it's diffeomorphic to the sphere. This is one of the deepest interactions between geometry and topology, and it allowed Perlman to solve this 98-year-old problem that had resisted attack by topologists of all stripes using all the ideas they could think of. Well, I can't explain the Ricci flow, but let me give you an analogy, which is another flow based on curvature. This is one we can see. It's for curves in the plane. So you take a smooth curve in the plane. At every point, it will have a curvature vector. The longer vector is tighter curvature. It always points, as I've indicated, in the direction from which the surface looks uh, con I never know what's concave and convex. Anyway, the picture tells you. You allow the curve to evolve. That's its derivative. What will happen, you see, is these little notches will flow out, the positively curved stuff will flow in, and after a little while it'll become convex. Once it becomes convex, it starts shrinking down, and as it shrinks down, it becomes rounder and rounder, and eventually disappears in a point. This is the one-dimensional analog of what happens in the Ricci flow for metrics. Okay. All right, that finishes complex geometry. Uh, sorry, that finishes Ramanian geometry. Let me go on now to complex geometry. And again, we'll go back to surfaces. So we have two overlapping coordinates, uh, coordinate patches. One's called x and y. The other's called x prime and y prime. On the plane, there's a natural complex structure. Z is x plus i, y on the first patch, and z prime is x prime plus i, y prime in the other patch. So now we have two complex variables in the overlap. We can ask how one depends on the other, and if z is a holomorphic function of z prime, that is a complex differentiable function, and vice versa, z prime is a holomorphic function of z, then we say such an atlas defines a complex structure, and the surface is a complex surface. <laughs>
right? So one example of this is the two sphere. Uh, take uh, two different complex coordinates, now I'm calling them z and zeta, uh, and identify the complements of the origin by zeta equals z inverse. Well, that's a nice holomorphic function away from the origin. The union of these two patches, much like in the case of the circle, have everything except the north pole, everything except the south pole, and on the overlap I have the same sort of zeta is z inverse, uh, which is holomorphic. This produces a holomorphic or complex structure on the two-sphere. Okay. In fact, every orientable surface has a complex structure. And unlike the Romanian metrics, these complex structures fall into a finite dimensional family. And I want to talk about the case of the torus. Okay. So suppose we have a complex structure on the torus. Let's unwrap the torus, remember it looks like this, unwrap it to give an infinite cylinder, and then unwrap the cylinder to give a dub doubly infinite plane. Well, this, it's called the covering space, will also have a complex structure. And there's a beautiful theorem in complex analysis that tells you that covering space automatically has to be complex analytically equivalent to the ordinary complex plane. And that means your torus is the quotient of the complex plane by some lattice of translations, and there's no um, loss of generality in assuming the lattice is generated by translation one in the x direction and some translation tau with positive imaginary part. So here I've tried to draw a piece of the lattice. Here's the real line. The complex plane, of course, goes vertically in both directions, and I've drawn a piece of the lattice uh, in the plane, it goes on forever. Um, the torus itself is made by identifying, if you translate by one, you will identify this side with this one. If you translate by this element tau, you will identify this side with this one. The same intersection pattern that we talked about before. So that's what all complex structures on the torus look like. So the complex structures on the torus, if you mark these two curves or you mark the translations which are going to generate your group of translations, it's simply identified with this, with this vector tau, something in the upper half plane. But we can change the basis of translations or the basis of curves by any two by two integral matrix of determinant one. So A, B, C, and D make a little two by two matrix. The determinant of that matrix has to be 1. And when you do that and you sort out what happens to this translation, tau goes to C plus D tau over A plus B tau. Thus, if you want to think about complex structures on the torus without a choice of this basis, you have to take the upper half plane and divide out by the action of this group of 2 by 2 matrices and see what you get. Well, I've drawn a fundamental domain for what you get. You have two vertical lines, so the circle, the semicircle is the unit semicircle, and the vertical lines are at uh, real part is minus a half and real part equals a half, plus an arc on the circle between them. If you look at the identification, tau goes to tau plus one, that identifies the two sides, and the other identification you need to think about is tau goes to minus one over tau, and that identifies the two halves of the circle that are drawn here, piece it all together, and that's what the space of complex structures on the torus looks like. I want to think about, when you do complex analysis, one of the most important things you think about is periods of holomorphic differentials. So I want to think about the holomorphic differentials on this torus and its periods around simple closed curves. So if you have a holomorphic differential on the on the surface, that's simply something that in the local holomorphic coordinates can be written as a function of z dz, where the function has to be a holomorphic function of z. You can integrate these differentials over curves by the usual sort of change of variable formula. I've written it there. And in case the, the one form is holomorphic and the curve is closed, it ends where it starts, the integral of the holomorphic form around the curve is called the period. And 
it doesn't change if we, as we deform the curve. Okay. So let's think about holomorphic differentials on our torus sigma. When we lift up to this covering space, the plane, we get a holomorphic different, a global holomorphic differential on C, which has to be of the form some holomorphic function times dz globally now. This function has to be doubly periodic under lattice translations. And again, there's a beautiful theorem in complex analysis which says that means the function is constant. So the only holomorphic differentials on the torus, all holomorphic differentials on the torus, lift to some constant lambda dz on C. And so if we integrate them around our two periods, 0 to 1 and 0 to tau, the integrals will be lambda and lambda times tau, and the ratio is tau. So from the holomorphic differential and its periods, you can determine tau. That is, you can determine the complex structure on the torus. Okay. Now, to presage what's going to come in a few minutes, I want to look at a small piece of this fundamental domain up near infinity. So I cut off at some height and look at everything above that height, which I've drawn in blue. Now the only identification I have to worry about is tau goes to tau plus 1. And if you take this blue thing and do that identification, you get the punctured disk. It's a nice thing to think about. And in terms of functions, the function on the punctured disk is the exponential of 2 pi i tau. Tau, remember, was something with imaginary positive imaginary part. So as tau goes up to infinity, that means the imaginary part's going to infinity. e to the 2 pi i tau then has real part going to minus infinity. And so q is going to 0 as tau goes to infinity. We look at the differential equation for these holomorphic forms, now thought of as ver uh, varying with q rather than with tau. And we get a nice differential equation called the Picard-Fuchs equation, which in this case is the q times the second derivative plus the first derivative is equal to 0. So what we've seen is that the periods of the holomorphic differential determine the complex structure of the torus and can even be used to give a natural local complex analytic parameter near infinity for the space of all complex structures on the torus. I don't think I'll say anything about higher dimensional holomorphic geometry except that it exists. And one is interested in periods of holomorphic differentials. Now they won't be one forms, there'll be holomorphic differentials of higher dimension and their periods. But I did want to finish complex geometry with what I know is one of Jim's favorite questions. Uh, an old and very famous question, does the six sphere have a complex structure? The two sphere has a complex structure, I already gave it to you, more or less. It turns out that no other sphere can possibly have a complex structure because it doesn't even have an infinitesimal complex structure. The six sphere does have an infinitesimal complex structure, but whether or not you can integrate that to give an actual complex structure, we don't know. This seems to be the favorite problem of famous mathematicians in their latter years. <laughs> and there have been many examples of claims of proof of this theorem by such famous older mathematicians, which have disappeared. There is, in fact, even one floating around today. I have my doubts. Time will tell. All right. Our last geometry is symplectic geometry. So. This again, like complex geometry, is a condition on the local coordinates and the way they overlap. So again, let's start with surfaces. Uh, on a little piece of surface with coordinates x and y, I have an air assigned area form, which we write as dx wedge dy. It's the usual. It associates the little piece of surface, the ordinary area of the surface, uh, with a, possibly with the negative sign. If I have another 
coordinate system, coordinates x prime and y prime. I can look at the area form in that coordinate system. The symplectic condition is that those area forms agree on the overlaps. And if they do, and we can cover the entire amount of the entire surface by coordinates where the these area forms agree on the overlaps, we have a symplectic structure on the surface. Turns out that every orientable surface has a symplectic structure, and amazingly enough, that symplectic structure is determined up to symplectic isomorphism by the topological type of the surface and the total area as measured by this form. It's a beautiful theorem. In higher dimensions, we have to use an analog of this form. If we have, we have to have an even dimensional space, and let's say 2m, we use uh, this obvious generalization of dx wedge dy, dx1 wedge dx2 plus dx3 wedge dx4, and so on. These are two-dimensional area forms. And again, if we can cover the manifold with coordinate charts so that these forms agree on the overlap, we have a symplectic manifold. It is not understood exactly which higher dimensional manifolds have symplectic structures, though there are some general necessary conditions that are known. It's also not known how to tell symplectic structures apart. When is one symplectic manifold different from another? But we have a, a tool that's come into play fairly recently that tells us a lot about symplectic geometry uh, and it comes, uh, comes about with the following beautiful um, insight of, or observation of Gromov. If you have a, so a symplectic manifold always has an infinitesimal complex structure. You don't expect that structure to integrate to give an actual complex structure, but on each tangent space, you have a complex structure varying smoothly. You can always put those on. Once we impose one of those, we could ask for surfaces inside our, our higher dimensional space whose tangent spaces are complex. And the amazing thing is in two dimensions, uh, one of these infinitesimal complex structures is automatically an honest complex structure. So these curves, which we would call pseudo-holomorphic, actually carry a holomorphic structure. That gives a lot of the power of complex analysis to those curves and produces a lot of rigidity in these pseudo-holomorphic curves that you wouldn't expect starting just from the symplectic picture. So one counts these pseudo-holomorphic curves in various ways, and this leads to what's known as Gromov-Witten theory and to quantum cohomology. One can also consider uh, boundary versions of this problem where you look at pseudo-holomorphic disks, the honest uh, two disk, where the boundary is constrained to lie on uh, what are called Lagrangian submanifolds. This leads to something called floor homology. And both of these are extremely powerful invariants. They've revealed to us some of the richness of symplectic geometry, uh, but by no means are they the whole story. And as the names indicate, quantum cohomology, Lagrangian submanifolds, there's a close connection between these symplectic notions and ideas coming from physics. And I want to end the symplectic part of the talk by presenting a famous enumerative question, which exists in, existed in mathematics from the 19th century. Uh, I won't tell you why these particular numbers, but believe me, this is the ones you have to use. Look at a quintic equation in five complex variables. So I've written one there, the Fermi equation. This equation cuts out a complex three-dimensional manifold, let's call it Q, in complex projective four space, which is a symplectic manifold because, because the ambient space is symplectic. We consider pseudo-holomorphic curves in this space. In fact, they're automatically holomorphic since the ambient space is complex. We want to look at those of topological type S2. Now, in this three-dimensional variety Q, we can take 
a generic intersection with a co-dimension one linear subspace of the ambient projective space, and we get a two-dimensional complex surface H, and we can measure the degree of these topological curves by calculating its in their intersection number with H, and for each K, let's let NK be the number of these curves of degree K. The enumerative problem is how many are there? Turns out with these numbers, they're always finitely many, at least conjecturally, and you want to know how many. Mathematicians knew N1, they knew N2, and that's as far as they got. In fact, physics provides an evaluation of something very closely related to these numbers containing equivalent information. It's called the quantum product, and it's given by this power series, 5 plus the sum of k cubed, don't worry about that, these numbers in k, and then a power series in q that are written q to the k, 1 minus q to the k, summed over k. So physics tells us how to evaluate this power series, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, and thus to determine the numbers in k, determined all of them, which was quite a surprise to the mathematicians. Okay. All right, in the last five minutes and 28 seconds, I want to talk about the interactions of these areas of mathematics with theoretical physics, and let me back up a little bit to before the mid-19th century. So before 1850, anyway, there was only one subject. It was called natural philosophy, and people weren't mathematicians or physicists. They were natural philosophers. Newton, is he a mathematician or a physicist? Well, he's greatest, one of the greatest physicists ever. He also invented calculus, which is a basis of analysis in a lot of mathematics. Uh, other names that are very famous in mathematics, Laplace introduced the Laplacian, which is a fundamental operator in mathematics, studying celestial mechanics. Fourier introduced his Fourier series to study the heat equation. Lagrange introduced what are now called the other Lagrange equations to, do, to study the problem of the tautochrome, which if you don't know, I didn't before I prepared this talk, is a nice problem to think about. Okay. After about 1850, mathematics and physics began to diverge. M mathematics was introducing its rigor, the definition of a function, which hadn't been defined before, of a space, which is topology, geometry of various types, of the type I've been talking about, Romanian geometry, 1862, symplectic geometry, which arose originally out of Hamiltonian mechanics. Math mathematicians began to rigorous understanding of power series, calculus on manifolds, differential equations, structures of manifolds. They were doing this generalization, abstraction, generalization, abstraction, in this whole period and continue to do it today. Physics, of course, took two big twists, uh, one 1900 to 1925 with the introduction of quantum mechanics and, of course, Einstein's general relativity. But during this period, 1850 to 1970, I think it's fair to say the, the interactions between physics and mathematics during this period were of physicists availing themselves of ever more mathematical ideas, techniques, and results. The mathematics was there. When the physicists finally realized what it was they were doing, they reached in, found the right mathematics, or some mathematician told them about the right mathematics, and they used it. I want to give you three quick examples of this. In the 1880s, Hilbert was studying certain operators on infinite dimensional spaces, and in particular their characteristic values or eigenvalues in the German. He called this invariant of the operator its spectrum because it reminded him of the recently discovered spectral absorption lines of atoms. By the time 1925, the quantum mechanics was rigorously formulated. The formulation was in terms of operators on this Hilbert spaces, and the absorption lines of atoms were exactly the spectrum of an operator that goes with the atom. So 1905, Einstein formulated special relativity, and he struggled for 10 years to find the appropriate formulation of general relativity. Finally, one of his mathematical colleagues suggested that Ramanian geometry 
might be relevant to the solution. Shortly thereafter, Einstein had the formulation in terms of a slight variant of Ramanian geometry. Space-time is curved by matter and energy so that its Ricci curvature tensor, this one that I introduced, matches the stress-energy tensor. Light travels along geodesics, which seem to be bent because of the curvature of space, exactly as uh, Riemann had foreseen. Gauge theories, it was realized by many different people, Weil, Pauli, lots of others, that Maxwell's equations uh, could be reinterpreted as a gauge theory for abelian gauge group, the circle. Gauge theory for non-abelian gauge groups were introduced in 1954 by Yang and Mills. And from the mathematical point of view, the fundamental object, well, from the mathematical point of view, the fundamental object is not the curvature, which, as we've seen, gives force, but rather the connection from which the curvature is derived. Connections and their curvature are natural extensions of Ramanian geometry and were developed by mathematicians in the first half of the 20th century. And in fact, there's a beautiful experiment by Aharonov-Bohm in 1959 that shows that the connection has physical consequences even in the case when its curvature is zero. These examples and many others led Wigner to write a paper in 1960 entitled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. He said, the first point is that the enormous usefulness of mathematics in the natural sciences is something bordering on the mysterious, and there is no rational explanation for it. He goes on to quote a mathematician to the effect that all these difficulties are but consequences of our refusal to see that mathematics cannot be defined without acknowledging its most obvious feature, namely, it is interesting. <laughs> That's why we do it. We don't do it because we know it's going to connect up to real life again. We do it because it's interesting. Wigner then finishes art, his article by saying, the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. We should be grateful for it and hope that it will remain valid in future research and that it will, that it will extend to our pleasure, even though perhaps also to our bafflement, to wide branches of learning. So I think this summarizes this 1960s point of view of you physicists reach in and grab the mathematics they need. Well, that's changed since 1970. Uh, with the introduction of, with well, the nature has changed. Um, with the introduction of quantum field theory and the rate of change has even accelerated with the standard model of particle physics, which is based on gauge theory, and an attempt known as string theory to go beyond the standard model and hopefully integrate gravity. The two relevant properties of these newer physical theories are, first of all, they have no rigorous formulation, and secondly, they use ever more sophisticated geometry and topology in their formulations. I'm going to skip these two examples and just try to finish on the reason, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, what's, what's going on. So many, most, quantum theories have limits that are described in classical geometric and topological terms. And these classical limits, the quantities of the quantum field theory or string theory, have some limiting classical geometric expression. Even more interesting is that a given quantum field theory may have many different limits which are described in geometric terms that, from the point of view of classical geometry, have nothing to do with each other. Often these different limits are related by dualities in physics. But any quanti quantities in the field theory that are topological in nature, I do not change as we deform the theory, will then be calculable in geometric terms by taking any one of the classical limits. And the answers have to agree. This produces statements that two very different classical geometric expressions are equal. So here's my picture of physics. This big blob in the middle is our quantum field theory or string theory. And these cusps out here are the classical geometric limits. And here we have a deformation, but suppose we have some quantity we can calculate in physics that's invariant under deformation. 
We could calculate it over here classically. We could calculate it over here classically. And we get two answers, maybe from very different classical geometric setups, that I, in fact, have to agree. So we're getting so. This leads to physics predictions of certain classical mathematical relationships. Sometimes these statements are already known. Sometimes they're new but accessible by known techniques. And sometimes they're unlike anything we've seen before and remain mathematical mysteries revealed by the Delphi oracle of string theory and quantum field theory. And to finish, the first incarnation of mirror symmetry in mathematics was used to calculate this power series that I wrote down before, calculating the number of rational curves on the quintic threefold in terms of periods of integrals on some other completely different holomorphic three-dimensional manifold. So those calculations led to an actual analytic expression, and this is a power series, and this power series is the power series ex um, um, development of that analytic function. So this is just one of many interactions. Well, I won't say that. So this is just the tip of a huge iceberg. Mirror symmetry is now understood mathematically as an isomorphism between a symplectic geometry category and a complex analytic category. Full statements to say nothing of complete proofs are still far off even 25 years after the introduction of mirror symmetry to mathematics. And mirror symmetry itself is just one example of how questions from physics have been driving a large part of progress in geometry and topology over the last, I could say, 30 years. And of course, the flip side is the physicists need this progress in order to make further progress themselves in the study of these quantum field theories and string theories.